What are the hardest issues for people to address? Best-selling author Maria Hornbacher knows. She'll discuss them next on Global Perspectives. This is Global Perspectives with Pulitzer Prize-winning commentator John Garcia. Welcome to Global Perspectives. Difficult issues draw the attention of best-selling author and award-winning journalist Maria Hornbacher. Her books, including Madness, have been translated into multiple foreign languages. Welcome to the show, Maria. Thank you for having me. Take us back to the beginning. When were you first inspired to write? Honestly, I was four. My parents gave me a blank notebook. It made me very nervous. I'm like, where are the words? Um, and I filled it and decided to call it a novel. So my first book was when I was four. I was awful, I'm sure. Um, but that was really when I wanted to write, was when I realized, oh my gosh, there's a whole blank page there for me. So wh what was the inspiration? Was, was it your life? Was it something you experienced? Uh perhaps something else? I think my family was in the theater. Both my parents were actors, and so I saw stories constantly. I saw stories on the stage. I saw dramas backstage. I saw stories at home. And so really what I wanted to do was capture um, the narrative. I think really what I wanted was to tell these stories that had a flow and um, that had a resolution of some kind in the end. Um, I have to ask, you went to boarding school, and I often hear boarding school horror stories. Was mm. yours a, a good experience, a bad experience, a neutral experience? It was amazing. I loved it. I went to an arts academy, and so what it was was a whole bunch of very nutty kids all at once on a campus far away from everything. And so we became, we became a little nuttier in context of one another, but it was such a beautiful training um, in all of the arts, not just my own field of writing. Um, I got to listen to jazz every night. I got to go to the theater every afternoon. It was just, it was remarkable. I was very happy there. So you had a sense that you were going to go into a writing career from early on and and you just pursued it. Um, I did. I, uh, I think I knew I was going to be a writer very shortly after I decided to be a writer when I was four. Um, I don't know why I knew. I just knew that there was a uh, there was a door opening there. And then when I got to boarding school, I was a writing major, and the door opened wider because they said, you can write whatever you want. We're just going to edit it like mad. And so they really gave us a shot and let us do what we wanted to and let us explore the forms. And um, that possibility kept opening and opening into my books. Tell us about your first book the first as an adult. Yeah. <laughs> the first book I wrote was Wasted. Um, I wrote it when I was about 22. It came out when I was 23. It's very young to write a book. It's very young anyway, and so I hesitate to recommend it to people. Um, the writing a book at 22, you should be doing things like, <clears throat> I don't know, going to college. Um, but it was important to me to get a word out at that time on the struggle that people were having, especially women were having, with eating disorders, with body image, and with the culture that we live in. It was important to me to say something about it that wasn't being said. There was a lot that wasn't being talked about, and I thought we need to, we need to have this on the table. So this was nonfiction. It was largely your own story. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. It was a memoir. It was entirely my own story, told from the point of view of someone later who's got some kind of cultural context to put experience into. It was not a book written from the heart of the beast. It was, it was very much a book written back looking at the beast um, and trying to take it apart and examine it more carefully for its um, the real nature, to truly, tr truly try and understand what, uh, what culture has that creates these ill people, that creates this hunger nationwide. So you were both interested in the subject and willing to explain it using yourself. I was. I was honestly much more interested in the subject than I was interested in writing my story. <laughs> to tell you the truth, it was originally, my intention was to make it an academic book. Um, publishers had different ideas. This was the height of the memoir boom. Um, and so they said, hey, let's tell your own story and a little more of your own story and a little more. So pretty soon it wasn't an academic book at all. It was a memoir. Um, I was 23, though, so what did I know? And it became a very different book than I knew it would become. But now it's used in academic settings on a regular basis worldwide. It is used in academic settings. Um, it's used in a couple of areas, you know, in psychology and women's studies and in writing itself. I think it's an interesting example of how to use memoir to report a story. Um, I've seen other books that have done that successfully, and that's what I was trying to do with it. I think that may be why it's taught, because it combines the forms a little bit. Um, 
of the research and the creative writing and the knowledge base and the personal input. So I think it kind of tries anyway to bind up a lot of forms. And what was the response in general to your first book? <clears throat> My first book was um, apparently quite alarming. <laughs> it was not alarming to me, but it was, <clears throat> it did receive a lot of attention. And it did, it, it made some people mad, it made some people glad. I got thousands of letters. I still get thousands of letters from that book. Um, and it, it, it opened up a conversation, I think. Now we've been having a conversation about this, this area of, you know, popular culture for a long time. But at the time, no one was talking about eating disorders. No one was being honest about eating disorders. And so it came out as kind of a loud yell, um, much more than it would now. Why is it so difficult for people to talk about disorders? I think it's difficult for people to talk about disorders because it's about them. You know, when I talk to you about a concern I have, it may be hard for you because it's talking about you too. And so <clears throat> if I write a book about eating disorders and you happen to have one or you happen to struggle along those lines, you may not want to hear about that, in which case I recommend you not read the book. But other people <clears throat> have a hard time going without talking about it. It depends on <clears throat> what kind of reader you are. Do you want to read the difficult stuff? Do you want to read the, the easy stuff? <clears throat> and I tend to write towards the difficult stuff to open those conversations so that they can be had. It's like hatching conversations. Let's have this out. Let's see what kind of animal this really is. Um, other people would prefer that it go right back in its shell. I just happen to be the kind that wants it out on the table. Uh, where do eating disorders start? Uh, do they start with an obsession? You had written something to the effect that people who are obsessed with food either become gourmet chefs or disorders, or something, to, <laughs> something to that effect? Something to that effect. I think it starts when, uh, with an obsessiveness mm -hmm. more than the obsession itself. I look at eating disorders as coming from three areas of a self. It comes from personality. Um, the disorder will come often out of a family background, uh, but it also comes in a great part from culture. It comes from a social imperative of looking away, being away, fitting norms, fitting stereotypes, and we kind of try and make ourselves two-dimensional to make ourselves the perfect body, the perfect person, the perfect you know experience, and we don't really understand anymore who we are as humans, as bodies. And so eating disorders will evolve out of fear, they evolve out of anxiety, they evolve out of obsessiveness, they evolve out of chaotic family situations. So it's a big mishmash of things. And in recovery, what you have to do is worry those threads apart and go, okay, this is the culture, this is the family, and this is what I myself need to face. Do you experience some sort of freedom in talking about these disorders. I, I, I seem to hear Janis Joplin echoes <laughs> from time to time. Honestly, it, it, it feels freeing now in quite a long ways after that book was published to be able to say it as a recovered person, to be able to talk about this as someone who has moved way beyond um, illness and to be able to talk about it honestly. Because when you're in the heart of it, it's very difficult to talk about it in any way other than um, than a frustrated, angry sort of way. Now it's nice to look back and be like, the world has changed a lot, but I have changed more. Mm -hmm. um, and to be able to say my recovery matters more than that illness in my life. Were you ever fearful to go so public with these inner issues? I, I, I can't yeah. imagine you weren't. I wasn't. I was 22. <laughs> so I wasn't very afraid, afraid to go forward into the public with this because I didn't really know what the public was. Um, I mean, at 22, you don't really know a radio station. You don't know a TV set. You don't know any of the stuff that means big. Um, what you know is your notebook and your computer, and then they send it out into the world. And suddenly, it's a book. Suddenly, it's a thing. Coming back to memoir two books later, then I was afraid of taking mm -hmm. it out into the world when I knew better. Now, most people don't start with a memoir, but you, you wrote mm -hmm. two, and mm -hmm. you also have written a number of fictional works. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Did those give you different sorts of pleasure? Was one more pleasurable than the other? Or yes. I much, I much prefer writing um, fiction to writing memoir. Um, there are areas of nonfiction that I love passionately. Essay, um, journalism, I love all of that. I love to write it. Writing memoir is actually very challenging for me, and I know that's you know counterintuitive since I've written two, but it's still a very difficult thing for me to stay in that net of this is the true story. You know, there is no room to move around that in the memoir form. You have to be truthful as a person and as a writer. Um, so it's not that it's hard to be truthful, it's that it's very bearing. You know, you have to, you have to push away all your fictional tools mm -hmm. and say this is the truth of what I mean. 
your first fictional work started with a difficult issue as well. It did. Uh, and I'm sure that was not by chance. No, I think it's because I keep falling into these holes where I need to write a, a book about another difficult issue. But in that case, I was writing, I wanted to sort of solve the kind of grief that can come to a family, not make it better, but understand it. And so I needed, you know, 310 pages to understand the grief that had come to this particular family. It's about suicide and um, the healing that takes place. The book is, the vast majority of is is the healing part. The first 60 pages, there's the suicide part. But really, the book is about how do people heal in the aftermath of great pain. Did you draw that experience out of your imagination, or did you actually go out and interview people who had survived a suicide environment? I think um, what I what I did with that one was I interviewed a lot of people from the town where it was set mm -hmm. to get the feel of the town, the place. Place is very important in my work, like where am I, what's the feeling, what's the era. Um, and so I interviewed and I stayed in that town for about a year, hanging out mm -hmm. at the bars, playing okay, pool. So you knew it. So I got the people, I got the sense of the people and the difficulties of living in that part of the country, which are myriad. And so. I did not myself experience a suicide in my family. Um, the two children in the book are aspects of myself, of young friends. The older woman in the book, <clears throat> Claire, is older than I was when I wrote it, and I had to imagine way ahead of myself in that character. And so it was a really good exercise, a really good exploration of minds mm -hmm. for me. You're wiser now. Are you I also hope. a better writer? I think in some ways I am, in some ways not. I think there's a bravery inherent to being a young, 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 young writer um, <clears throat> that takes the editor off. I think now there's there's more craft, there's more, there's more I think, probably skill. Um, the vocabulary of forms is broader. The vocabulary of what it is I'm trying to do is broader. The guts may not always be as brash. And so that is something I have to tap when I'm writing a new book now. I don't have to tap any sort of wildness, but now I do have to tap that bravery that sometimes can recede into our youth. You've written a lot of books, but you've also said that books are dangerous. What does that mean? Yeah, I think books are dangerous. <clears throat> I think books speak to something in people that is wild. You know, and so I have books that I wish I had not written in the way that I wrote them. Um, I have books that I'm very proud of because people can feel very passionate about them. But they are books that reach people at a gut level. Um, I hope that is true and that is dangerous. I hope that people can take them for what they are, which is just books. I think there are many, many books that have been written that are not as dangerous as we have thought. Um, a book has very little power in itself. A book with a reader has a lot of power. In your journalistic writing, do you pursue the same difficult issues or different ones? I pursue different difficult issues. Different, different. Actually, most of what I write as a journalist these days is about theater. Mm -hmm. I write a lot of theater criticism. I write a lot of theater analysis, and I travel all over doing that. Um, my journalistic work has tended to focus on challenging social issues. Homelessness is, uh, is something that I've come at a number of different ways from a number of angles, especially focusing on homeless children. Um, I've written a lot about science. I've written a lot about artists of a variety of stripes, uh, jazz musicians, painters, and it's something that brings me enormous joy in a way that writing books brings me an enormous challenge. Mm -hmm. Writing about the arts and science makes me feel enormously freed. Do you get some of the same sorts of feedback to your journalistic work as you do to your books? You know, yes, I think people enjoy the humor. I think people respond to the, the language that I use, which tends to be fairly lyrical. Um, I think people respond to both of those things, but they don't feel as jarred, I think, mm -hmm. by, my, by my journalism as they do by my books. How, how does it feel to you to think that your books have been translated into so many languages and are read all over the world? Are, are, I like it, <laughs> not because like, oh, it's fantastic, <laughs> but because I get letters. Mm -hmm. I got this wonderful letter from a little boy recently in Russia who had read who knows which, and he said, you introduced me to Robert Frost. I don't know how I was okay without Robert Frost. And I'm like, I don't know how we were okay without Robert Frost either. And so that connection <laughs> from here to Russia, which is where my family's from actually, uh, that connection is powerful to me. I get letters from people in Saudi Arabia who are living entirely different experiences than I have, and they are reading my books. And that is, it's just a gift to me. It's a gift. Do you travel a lot? I to travel other constantly. Countries? Okay. Yeah. Uh, do you have favorite places? And Portugal. Por Portugal. I what, love what, Portugal. Why? It's too beautiful. The sea. Uh -huh. The sea is gorgeous. Um, I love Portugal, and I love the northern parts of America. Mm -hmm. In particular, Superior, uh -huh. Lake Superior, and the hiking trails around there. I hike a lot. 
So what are some of the places overseas that you haven't traveled to that you would like to visit? I would like to see a lot of France. There's a lot of France I would like to see. I want to go back to Italy and explore on foot. Mm -hmm. um, I really want to explore most of the country on foot if I can. Um, I get tired of cars. I get tired of planes. I like getting out on my feet on the ground. Um, I'd like to see the Andes. Um, I'd like to hike the Appalachian Trail. So there are a lot of places I'd like to get my feet on the ground and really kind of be part of the world. Yeah, you don't often hear that. I, I too like to explore places on foot. Yes. And, and most of the time I hear people say, well, I want to take a tour, I uh, want to be managed in some yeah. way. But, yeah. but exploring on foot takes you in so many different directions. Absolutely. You have no idea where you're going to arrive. You have no idea if you're going to arrive anywhere. But it does give you that sense of, if I get lost in this place, I will find my way somewhere. And so that kind of lostness and arrival feels great to me. Why France? What, what is it about France that's alluring? Honestly, I've never been there. And that's very strange that, I mean, I've been lots and lots of places, but I've never been to Paris. Mm -hmm. And I've never been to the countryside in France. And I just, you know, I want to see the Louvre. <laughs> well, you should. And I, I've been to France a lot. In fact, yeah. I used to live there as a child. So oh. it's, it's something that's very, very near and dear to me. Yeah. Uh, what kinds of activities do you engage in when you're not writing? I do a whole lot of more writing. I read a great deal. I teach um, and I read a lot about science. Um, science and nature are a huge passion of mine, are huge passions of mine, and it's important to me to have a sense of what's happening in scientific discovery. So I research a lot, um, I do a lot of reading, but besides that, I hike. Um, I spend a lot of time with my family and friends. Mm -hmm. We do a lot of travel together. And so it's all kind of of a piece. I go places with people, I explore, I spend time in the woods by myself. Um, it's a lot of grounding. It's a lot of grounding for me because I think writing is too much in your brain. You like the cold weather. I do like the cold weather. Yes, I do. It's, I hate walking on shoes in ice, but the cold weather makes me kind of hibernate. I get a lot of writing done in the wintertime. Tell me about your teaching. My teaching? What do you teach? I teach creative writing, mm -hmm. <clears throat> creative writing in English. I teach mostly graduate students. My favorite students actually are the undergraduates, not that the graduates aren't wonderful and I love them, but the undergraduates come in with such a sense of wonder and possibility mm -hmm. and they mess it all up and they break <laughs> open walls and they'll try anything. Graduate students I love because that they've honed some craft um, and they are you know, brilliant writers and they can really push themselves to write truly finished work. So I enjoy both, I enjoy both. When you travel, do you at times run into people who become characters in your books? Yes, <laughs> I do run into people who become characters in my books and I never know when they will show up in the book. Um, I read people's stories in the newspaper and I never know when that person's going to arrive in a book, but often I know they will. Um, and so when I meet people in my travels, they become people who are very real to me, unfortunately, I can't keep watching their story, so their story generally goes into my fiction so mm -hmm. that I can see where their story goes for me. Do you sort of keep these ideas in a storehouse, mental storehouse, and then draw on them, maybe not all for one particular work, but for a future work? Yes, I also keep a notebook, I keep mm -hmm. a file. I mean, a, a computer file, because it's, it's thousands of pages thick at this point, of bits of writing, and it's titled Bits. And I have characters, and I have titles, and I have passages, and I have dialogue, and I have monologue uh, in these passages. But that's where you'll find my people. You can scan through and be like, there's a character, there's a person, here's a story. And so that's very useful to me, because when I'm at a blank spot, I just go into bits and find a bit to work on. How has your writing changed with the advent of computers? Because you wrote in both worlds. Mm -hmm. I did write in both worlds. I mean, I didn't get a cell phone until I'd been divorced once. And so I'm, you know, that age where internet didn't exist while I was, um, when I was young. So computers have gotten me more information. They've also isolated me more, I think, because I'm more behind the screen. Are you working on a current project, a I new am. book? I am working on a new book. It's a profile. There are 10 profiles in this book. It looks at the science of mental health recovery. How do people move beyond illness and into healing? Um, and what does science, what does the progression of science of the mind, what does that do to forward the, the lives of people and their health? Can you explain what that means? Because often you hear those terms mm. in mental health mm -hmm. recovery circles and, sure. and nowhere else. Sure. I think people are very un unfamiliar with the idea that mental health recovery exists, but there's a whole recovery movement, and people in the sciences are, are discovering more and more that there is the possibility of healing, of remission, of, of changing mental illness into mental recovery and mental healing. 
So that changes over time, but it is a new, a new concept for a lot of people, which is, you know, hence I got to write a book. What, what is influencing the book as you move along? Um, the new discoveries in science, the brain work that's happening right now, genetics, um, cognitive science, cell biology, is all kind of wrapping up into this amazing world where you can study what happens in the mind. But really, to tell the story, you have to get at the people. You know, this is my life, this is how this technology helps me, and this is how my life changes. So the important thing is to draw the stories out. To go back to teaching for a moment, when you, you talked about your undergraduate and graduate students, how do you know or, or do you have the sense that somebody is on track to become a writer? Mm, mm -hmm. and, and do you feel a responsibility to mentor that person? Yes, I do feel a responsibility to mentor that person. I send their name out to people who I know would be interested in their work. I get them, um, I encourage them to publish. I encourage them to submit, take their rejection letters, keep them in a pile and keep submitting. Um, when, I, when I know someone's going to be a writer is honestly when they give me when I have eye contact with them throughout the course. You know, when they are right there, when they are right there present, their material is in various stages of completion. But when you hear that voice, when you hear a single voice that is unique to that person, you know, you can, you can hear them writing 10 years down the road. You said your family is originally from Russia. Mm -hmm. Do you travel to Russia often? I have never been to Russia. Well, that's another one. <clears throat> yeah, it. it's another place I gotta stop. Do you have a, a list of countries that you plan to visit in a particular order, or is it more, more random than the that? The whole world is my bucket list. There, is, there are a million countries I want to be, I want to see. I would like to go to Australia because I have friends there. Now that I've received letters and met people from all over the world, I want to go to their homes. I want to see them in their context. Um, so Portugal, I'd like to go back. Italy, I'd like to go back. But Australia, New Zealand, Brazil, there are places all over the world I'd like to go. When you address an audience for the first time, whether it's a class or mm -hmm. something at a public forum, what is the most common question that you're asked? Honestly, the most common question I, I get asked is, how, what, what was it like to put all that personal information out there? And I think, again, I wasn't aware that it was going out there. <laughs> you know, all the personal information I put goes down on a page. And so when people think they know me, they know an author. They know the person who wrote the book. The problem with authors is they keep going long after the book is finished. So, you know, it's very mixed. Is there another fictional work on the horizon? Yes, I'm working on a new book, um, a very thin, a very slender volume about a, a couple who are going past one another in psychological mm -hmm. worlds. And so they, they miss each other like boats in the night. Is there any subject you would not tackle? I would probably not tackle, no. There's not a subject I would not tackle. <laughs> There's really not. I wouldn't be equipped in some areas, but I, I would try anything. If you had to give up some aspect of your career, would it be the fiction writing, the nonfiction writing, the teaching? Oh, gosh. If it would be the memoir. Heart, the memoir. Um, I really love creative nonfiction on other topics. I really love writing fiction. I'm done writing memoirs. Two is enough, mm -hmm. you know. Um, two is enough for me. And um, I would not give up the journalism or the art criticism. So I'd have to go. The memoir could go. Have you ever thought about other activities, politics and such? Because you're, you're articulate and informed about issues that many people aren't. Mm -hmm. And I think that is, is very appealing. That's interesting. I had thought about politics when I was young, but golly, I made a big mess in my life. And I think if anybody dug anywhere in my past, it would never fly. It would never fly. But I do, I do advocate quite a bit, and my advocacy has become more a piece of my life than I, than I anticipated that it would. You talked about how you like to spend time with family mm -hmm. and, and friends. Are your friends writers or, or not writers? They are generally painters. Um, there are a few writers, but I actually have found a great deal of commonality with visual artists, um, musicians, photographers. Um, my friends generally are creative types, if we know what those are. Um, I can't define them. But they are people who think out of the box, who bounce around like sort of intellectual pinballs and are very creative human beings. And those people I find deeply inspiring and uh, satisfying as human beings. Great. Well, thank you so much for joining us today, Mario. Thank Hanbach. you for having me. And thank you. For Global Perspectives, I'm John Bercia, and we'll see you next time.